Um, hello, everyone. I'm uh, Wim Provost, and I'm a product manager for uh, OpenV Storage. And uh, today, I want to take a little bit of your time to tell you about uh, a cool project we did uh, about OpenStack storage across data centers. Um, I'm going to address the issues we saw, how we, how we fixed them. We had to do some uh, manual stuff. We had to, to fix things. We had to do things differently, because um, we had a real challenge by um, a hosting provider in the US. They have five data centers, and they wanted storage across those data centers. They wanted even to lose a data center without having data loss. Um, it's a hosting company, so that means they need very fast storage. They want to run um, MySQL servers. They need to run yeah, fast servers. They need to run whatever that needs a lot of IOPS. Um, and of course, they need block storage. Um, they also had a requirement that since they had five data centers, they didn't want if one of the data centers went down that there was like a, a glitch with, with read errors and write errors. So that's something that we also had to take into account. Um, it's a hosting provider, so that means they have lots and lots of storage. So we're talking about multi petabytes um, scale. Uh, and of course, as, a, as any project, they wanted low TCO, so we had to do it uh, as cheap as possible. Uh, so that's kind of in a, a nutshell where we started from. That were the requirements from the customer. So um, based on those requirements, you can uh, you can already tell that it's a, a very hard hard uh, thing to tackle. It's a, it's really a beast uh, to tame. Um, you have different questions that will uh, play. If you spread data across data centers, there's a, a lot of things that you need to take into account. Um, first of all, how are you going to make it fast? That's kind of the, the biggest issue, and especially if you want to do block storage, if you want to run uh, like MySQL servers or, or uh, database servers, it needs to be fast. You also want to have low TCO. You cannot copy the data five times. That's not going to work. If you have a multi petabytes, five times multi petabyte, that's really a lot of money. So that's something that we couldn't do. Of course, if you have five data centers, you need a network between, that, uh, between those data centers, and those uh, networks need to be fast kind of uh, logic. Uh, but we had to uh, answer the question which network was required. Um, what about metadata? It's one of the most um, stupid things, because everybody thinks metadata of volumes of storage is like something natural. But if you do it at a scale across data centers, it becomes a very hard task to solve. It's really a puzzle to deal with. If you're doing it locally, that's quite easy to do. Uh, you've got all the, the hyper-converged solutions which can handle that. But across data centers, that's really a different, uh, a different task. That's really hard to do. And um, of course, they didn't want to go with a multi-betabyte setup uh, from day one. So they wanted to start small and grow. So we had to scale from a couple of uh, terabytes to really multi-betabytes. OK, so the first thing we, we did when we, uh, when we received that question was, OK, what can we do with OpenStack and with the current uh, storage within OpenStack? So the first thing we did is we looked at Swift, because that was capable of doing things across different sites, different data centers. And the storage can grow. I think everybody can uh, already knows that. But there's a, a problem um, with Swift. And it's not fast enough and doesn't have a block storage interface. So you can't run virtual machines on top of Swift. So that's kind of something we couldn't do. So the next thing. Um, if you look at the latest survey of OpenStack, um, around 60% of the OpenStack environments are running Ceph. So we said, OK, let's use Ceph to, to get this power, to get the, the storage power. It's got a block interface. Uh, storage can grow. I think everybody can, uh, can say that uh, that's true. Uh, except the, the block doesn't scale well across data centers. It's really meant to be in one data center, and it's um, also not designed for performance. It's not. Uh, it, it's a great product, but it's not designed for performance. Um, I guess there's a ton of uh, presentations here this week about the uh, performance of Ceph and how to improve it, but it's it's hard. You're not going to get it up to the speed that we need it. Uh, okay, Cinder with a traditional high-end SAN. That's like the the very expensive solution. You go to one of the big name vendors, you get some uh, big ass um, uh, sun, you get the uh, uh, very expensive software, you get some re replication between those sites, and it will work. It's got a block interface, it's a sun. Uh, it's expensive and it doesn't really scale. So that's uh, a problem. Did I, did I lose the. Okay. Oh, problem. 
Yeah, got it. Um, okay, so we're we're kind of pragmatic guys. We're storage guys, and if it doesn't exist, we build it. It's that simple. Um, so what we did is we took Cinder and we built uh, OpenV Storage, which is a, an open source storage technology, and we built that underneath Cinder, and it does things with first of all um, SSDs, PCI, PCI flashcards. That's for the performance, and we store cold data on um, uh, on hard disk, on traditional spinning disks. So that's in a nutshell what we did with OpenV Storage. Uh, as again, it's a, an open source uh, project, so it fits the, the TCO requirement also. So it's a, a a nice thing, a nice benefit. Now, um, if we when we built the OpenV storage, and we, we, we started doing it across data centers, there were a lot of problems that we needed to tackle. So before you start doing things on your own, I would like to discuss or would like to explain you what exactly we did and why we did it and um, uh, what kind of uh, uh, like solutions we had for the different problems. So the first one is um, we we know block storage is fast, and we know you have object storage, which is really scalable. That's like the two kind of things. We combined both, and we built um, uh, a distributed block layer, which uh, exposes block storage on the upper side, and uh, talks um, objects to the back to the back end. And um, we use a write buffer for that. And a write buffer is a log structured approach for those who are very technical. And it's basically you always append 4K blocks or 8K blocks or whatever kind of blocks to a file once it's big enough. Let's say you've got like 128 megabytes of, of writes, of consecutive writes of, of volume. You close that. Uh, you call it an object. We call it a storage container object, and we we shove it up to the backend. Uh, Going to talk a little bit more about the backend, but um, so that's the first thing we did. We built that block storage layer, which converts uh, to object storage. It's got built-in snapshots since we have that collection, all writes of uh, all 4K writes uh, of that volume. We can just do uh, very easy uh, snapshots. <laughs> Uh, because it's just metadata. It's just saying into that storage container at that position, uh, that's where you need to take the snapshot. And of course, you have a block storage layer, but people want different interfaces on top of that uh, block storage layer. So that's something that we had to take into account also. So we added iSCSI, Cinder, native blocks, so a lot of things. Now, if you do a block storage layer, the last thing you want, of course, is loose data. Um, you're running. Uh, servers, so any data loss is unacceptable. So we had to build um, a protection against that, because the write buffer is living on one server. And if that server would die, it's in the RAM or in the, the SSDs or the PCI flash uh, of that server, then you would have data loss. So we had to, to build a mechanism. We call it a distributed transaction log, because we have the log structured approach on the, on the write buffer. And it really safeguards outstanding data. So what happens if a write is coming in on one host, we copy it to another host, so to the uh, distributed transaction log of a second host. And uh, that means that if the first host dies, you always have a copy on the second host. Now, um, there's a few things that you need to know. Um, we had that requirement of making sure that we could lose a data center. So we had to make sure that this was capable of going across the data center. So that means that you had a really low latency link between the host and where your Distribution tr distributed transaction log is living. Now, in some uh, cases, we didn't have a very close data center. Uh, the data center was not close by, but it was a couple of yeah, miles away, a couple of hundreds of miles away. So it was too big. So we had to kind of leverage or uh, play a little bit um, with that. So that's the, the distributed block layer. So the second thing that we had to uh, answer is the backend. Um, we played a lot with how we would store the data on traditional hard drives, um, uh, and we, we didn't find a great solution. We didn't find a great object storage solution, which was um, doing exactly what we needed. So we have a different use case. Since we are um, creating those storage container objects, um, we have they are not uh, write sensitive, or they, they don't have, um, they don't care if the, the latency for the write is very, 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 uh, very high. Uh, it's throughput that we need on writes, but on reads we want very low latency. So we had a look at all the object storage solutions out there. So we had a look at Swift, at, at Ceph, and we kind of figured out that there's nothing that could solve our, our problem because if you take Ceph for example, they need to be fast at reads and at writes. 
And that's a problem. Because if you do fast at reads and fast at writes, you have to make some, some uh, yeah, you, have to, you have to cut some corners. You can't do everything at once. So since we have that write buffer, if something is uh, in the write buffer, we acknowledge it already to the application. So for writes, we're covered. So for us, writes is just about throughput. Now for reads, we kind of figured out if you put something on um, an object store and you need something back, just a 4K block of that storage container, it makes no sense to get that whole storage container object back. So you, if you need just 4K, you want to get 4K of that volume. You don't want the whole storage container object back. You don't want to take like 128 megabytes back or read that back from the back end, especially if it's across data centers, because then you're just adding latency. And latency for us is, is really crucial because um, for the reads, we're using uh, a backend which is completely on flash. So we're using SSDs, um, basically uh, cheap SSDs because we're using them for reads. Writes are going to or uh, RAM. Um, and we use HDDs um, for, um, uh, for capacity storage. Now there's one thing that we need to talk about is uh, metadata. We use explicit metadata. Uh, Ceph is use, uh, using uh, implicit metadata, which means that um, you, you have an algorithm which tells you where certain data is placed on the back end. We couldn't do that because we wanted really low latency and we wanted consistent low latency. So if we go to a disk, we, we need to be sure that it's there. Uh, one other thing that this allows us to do, it allows us to do suboptimal writes. Uh, it means that you write something with a, a, sp a spread or which is not optimally uh, spread across the, the back end, across data centers, but you keep a maintenance task which then does the optimal spread across data centers. And it also solves our problem where you write something but, uh, uh, but one of the data centers is not available. You just write it locally and when the data center is back, you just write it uh, to the back end. If you would have used implicit metadata, you can't do that because it's, it's an algorithm that tells you where everything is stored. So last thing is the metadata. Everybody that tells you metadata, um, you should do uh, you should do the duplication on your uh, on your volumes. That's crap. If you have lots of, uh, of 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 flash to address, you just can't put it all into RAM. So we had to make some um, uh, some some changes there. So we really limit the size of the metadata of volume, and we keep it in RAM just to make sure that it's fast enough. Volumes. Um, uh, the volume metadata is stored in a, a RocksDB, master slave RocksDB. That's something that we had to write ourselves also because RocksDB is just a database. And we keep the metadata or we keep the, the, the cluster um, metadata in, a, an, in our own distributed key value store. That's something that we wrote, wrote ourselves. Uh, and that's spread across all the data centers. It's sped up by using memcache as a caching layer on top of that. Uh, or it's also open source, so it's called Aracun. So the topology. Um, as we said, we have five data centers. We have one in Chicago, one in Boston, one in New Jersey, one in New York, and in Washington. And um, the first four, so except all, except uh, New York, have uh, HDD drives. So this is uh, like a ring, like a capacity tier across the data centers. So data is spread across those data centers. So if you lose one, we have three other data centers where, uh, where the data is stored. And in um, the fi five other, of, in the five data centers, we have a, a flash tier, which is keeping all the active data. So uh, you write something, it goes to the flash tier, and then it's flushed to the four data centers which have the, the capacity tier. Um, we have um, uh, also the possibility, for example, from our New Jersey data center to go uh, to bare metal clouds and things like that. So we've got a whole lot of things that we, that we did for that customer. So just a uh, summary. Um, storage across data centers, it's a really hard one to tackle. Uh, current OpenStack solutions are really not a fit, so we, you have to do it yourself. Um, so we did it for ourselves, we made the software, um, we created new backends, which is also open source, uh, it's on HDDs. We have that on HDDs for capacity, and we have one on uh, an old flash array, um, which is for the performance. We use explicit metadata. So we can uh, survive data centers, so we can um, uh, do suboptimal writes. We keep following metadata in RocksDB and uh, just a key value store for, uh, for everything else. So that's kind of in a nutshell what we had to tackle in, uh, in uh, making sure that we could survive data centers and spread data across data centers.